When you mix the fresh water of the river with the salt water of the sea, something wonderful happens. As if by magic, a life-supporting habitat is created for hundreds of species of fish, birds, and mammals. It's called an estuary. This protected body of water, often partially enclosed by reefs, barrier islands, or fingers of land, is distinct from all other places on Earth. In fact, it's irreplaceable. For you see, estuaries are the most productive ecosystems on Earth, containing more life per square inch than the richest farmland or deepest forest. This is an environment unlike any other I've ever been before. Like I love just seeing all the exposed rock um, during low tide. And it's really interesting looking at this really unique environment. Like there's all these little tide pools with uh, mostly snails, some barnacles over here. I think this is just a common barnacle. Periwinkle snails um, and some seaweed. I forgot the name of it. But yeah, I really like the group that I'm staying with. There's literally seven students and one TA living in this lighthouse together. Uh, our prof comes up during the day and then she has a place here so she doesn't stay with us. And it's so nice just to be around some other ecology geeks. Uh, we're all just doing work that we love and we're interested in and living with them has been so nice and peaceful. Everyone is so considerate, so kind. We like uh, bond over great dinners. We all take turns cooking for each other and it, it, it definitely feels like a group, like almost like a family, you know. Uh, it's really nice here and especially right now there's no wind the sun is out i'm just trying to soak it all in honestly i'm getting the best rest of my life here this is an environment that is very so much and oftentimes is seen as pretty hostile to organisms just because of the extreme um environmental variations like it's either submerged in water or then exposed to um the atmosphere uh, during low tide where organisms have to struggle with you know uh, really hot temperatures and potentially desiccation but so even though there aren't that many organisms here the ones that are are very hardy and you can tell that they're specialized to this environment and, and they just all fit together so seamlessly. There's a lot of shorebirds here too. We actually have seen one bald eagle hanging around here. Um, we have a lot of gulls, three species of gulls. There's ring-billed, which is the common gull you would see. There is a herring gull, which is like a little bit bigger and more gray. And then there's the black back, which has like black back of his body basically in the wings and stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of shorebirds here uh, come here to nest and migrate. And of course we have our resident seal population. You can't really see them because these kayakers uh, scared them off, but they usually hang out in that rock off the distance and yeah there's at least like 200 that hang around this area and honestly they kind of freak me out like they're really cute but also it's kind of freaky hearing them groan because they sound like the zombies from the walking dead so i'll just be hanging out outside uh playing my ukulele and all of a sudden i hear like Aah. And I have to like stop and make sure that there aren't any zombies waiting through the tide pools coming to get me because honestly the walking dead fucked me up. I like definitely. Um, I am definitely paranoid of the possibility of a zombie apocalypse. So yeah, the seals aren't helping with that, but it's awesome. Today we're taking mud core samples of the invertebrates in the mud flats in this estuary. <laughs> so, so we're here at low tide, which means the water has receded, um, exposing these mud flats. We're basically walking a hundred meters north or straight, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're walking back, ma'am, because we missed one. But yeah, basically we're just walking, and then when we find our spot. We're shoving this into the ground and scooping up all the little goodies we find inside. Ready? 
Here's their treating bag, but it's just full of tricks rather than treats. A couple worms. Something, something else. Yep. Lots of mud. Loosen it and out. Look, field work looks like, and then yeah, congrats. Thanks. the samples that we collect in the field and we're removing some of, of the mud cleaning it out with water and trying to find as many living or dead species as we can but we're not counting um, shells or fragments of shells if there's no specimen inside what's that like uh like 200 milliliters uh yeah yeah i guess <laughs> I mean, Do you have a measuring cup? that looks like the size of an average turd, so how much is that? <laughs> I don't know, I don't usually have a measuring cup on my butt. This one's alive. This one's alive, so we can keep that for dinner. <laughs> but it would need. Oh, wait, is he opening up because it's, I'm watering it? Oh my gosh. Oh, oh my god. Maybe. Hello, little boy. <laughs> is he opening because I'm Don't watering. close on my finger. <laughs> So there's, we've got one. If you want to look at him, you don't need to look at this guy. Oh, we need a little, maybe we need, I'll give you another tray for stuff. mucky for stuff, stuff and then yeah. specimens. Okay, the, yeah. And then this will be for under the microscope to okay. just so transfer So it'll go from the dirty tray to the good tray and then from the good tray into the microscope. Yep. So they start uh, picking out specimens from our sample. They give them to me and then I look through them through this microscope and try to figure out what they are using this iPad. Look at that. So that is a ragworm. First species I did. There's two of them there. This is a worm. This is our Neris diversicolor. And look at its freaking talons popped out there. That's actually kind of terrifying. Okay, we're trying to figure out what this guy was, huh? The other two, the living ones. Oh yeah, my yeah. god! Do you have any ideas? Um, it doesn't have feet. <laughs> I know. So it might be a different one then, like a uh, like look a at that worm. shit. Yeah. Totally. yeah. Okay. The other oh, worm oh, we oh, had. What's your high was Arenicola. That was one without not a fall. So it took eight biologists to decipher between these two. We think they're different species. We think this is the Baltic clam, based on this reference picture. <laughs> and then the other one, these ones, we think are soft shunk clams. But honestly, we're like just basing it off of like how different these tips look and like their overall shape. Like, this is so, <laughs> I feel like this is so unscientific. This is just like comparison and just guessing, ruling out. I don't know how zoologists do this. I, this is why I dropped out of zoology because it's just so hard. Okay, so to update you on the identification process, uh, we realized that it does get easier and I think the key component to that is that 
you need to see a lot of different organisms. Like it's really tough after only getting one or two samples to kind of identify these different species because a lot of the times they do look very similar. And at least um, the identification books that we had did not really give enough information for us to like distinctively uh, say whether it was this species or that one, like based on the first couple of samples. But we found that once we started to see more um, and identify, you know, is this uh, one part of the same species as that one or is it is it a different one? From there, we could kind of like gauge the similarities um, in like in organisms of the same species. And that allows us to identify, you know, what are the key characteristics of this species and how does that differ from another species? And from there, I think it got a lot easier to, you know, narrow it down and pinpoint what uh, organisms we were actually looking at. All right, so I have my little scooper net. Here's a little tide pool. And we're basically scooping up all the gamorids right now, which are these guys. They're like um, a soft-bodied uh, crustacean. And then we're going to collect as many as we can and test for parasites, basically. On a side note, I can't get over how cool these little tide pools are. Just in little rock crevices. There are so many different organisms here. Look at all that. Okay, so now that we've collected all these camerids, we're back in the lab and we're basically picking out each and every one of them, checking if there are parasitized, if they were, there's gonna be like a little dot on the back of them, on their like butt. And if not, then we're putting them in here and we are, are gonna release these healthy ones back into the wild. Hello. Okay, so I brought you guys here to the beach because I wanna show you how amazing this ecosystem is. And I wanna highlight especially the plants that are here. So over here, obviously, it doesn't look like there's much uh, and there really isn't in terms of the amount of uh, plant diversity. However, the plants that are here are extremely hardy and very essential in maintaining this ecosystem. So this is an intertidal zone and one of the biggest threats to this, in this environment is soil erosion. So basically when uh, the waves come in during high tide and especially during storms which are the strongest in the spring season, uh, they crash onto shore and then they carry away a lot of this soil because obviously it's a very loose substrate. This is sand, right? It can be easily washed away with the tide. Um, and that's a ma major issue here for the people living in uh, eastern Qu Quebec. This region is called the Gaspé region, I think, uh, or Bas Saint Laurent. Uh, basically a lot of people have built their houses right along the shore. Like literally, this is the house and this is the beach, right? So there is not much space uh, that they can lose. Like, so with climate change, uh, they're expecting that storms are going to get more frequent here, especially since the, this part of the St. Lawrence River doesn't ice over completely as often as it used to during the winter. So um, that allows more like waves to hit the shore and cause a lot of damage. So there are multiple strategies that the locals are trying to adopt in order to conserve their beach and combat this erosion problem. Some people um, have started building like these wall, stone walls right um, at the edge of their property so that if the waves hit them, they just crash into the wall and don't, hopefully don't go past it and, and flood their houses and basements especially. Um, and although it is slightly effective, the issue is that once those waves hit the walls, they carry a lot of the sand that's right next to the wall back into be into the water, which means in the following years, their, their beach is literally shrinking. There's less and less of it as more of it is carried away back into the river. Um, and so it isn't the best option. The soil is still very loose around those walls. And so another strategy that is much more natural and holistic is being proposed, which is just to plant more of these um, coastal plants basically on your property. The reason why these plants are so effective is because their root systems are extremely deep. Like 
to be able to survive in this kind of environment where again the substrate is literally sand that can come up like fall down like you it would not be useful for these plants if their roots were very shallow and right to the surface like any little wave action can uproot them basically so these plants have uh, adopted a strategy which is just to grow really thick and long roots deep into the soil um, and that is actually a really great thing because that those those root systems become very thick and widespread and basically stabilize the ground keeping the soil and the sand in place which means when the waves do hit them it, they don't take as much um, soil back with them all right, so this is the first plant that I wanna show you. This is called lime grass. So what's great about planting a plant like this right by the shore is that it's really hardy. It can withstand, you know, obviously being battered by waves uh, throughout the day. They have very waxy cuticles, which is important to contain water inside. The, there's a lot of wind here and salty air that is uh, coming from the sea, so they need to be able to withstand the saltiness and possible desiccation as well. And the major component of this plant that's really essential to being successful in this environment is having really, really deep root system. Like I can try to pull this out of this sand right now, but that took a lot of work. Yikes. I wasn't expecting to do that <laughs> whoopsie i'll put you back um but basically these things are really tough and hard to get out like it takes a lot of effort to pull one out and you'll likely break the top stem part before you uproot it unless you're an asshole and you're really trying like i am apparently but that is an essential quality to have in this environment um, because again, they are literally rooted in this very flimsy, ungrounded substrate. This gets carried away by the waves as they crash up to shore. So it's important to root yourself deep in the ground where you can avoid being swept into the uh, water basically. And as a result, the lower soil system is kept intact. So although some of this sand will obviously get washed away, there still is a lot of land that remains and, and that allows um, the water to not creep up as far the next following years. Good morning everyone. So I basically I'm out here right outside the lighthouse where we're staying. I have a, a scope right behind me and an extra pair of binoculars and I'm basically just counting shorebirds right over here at the bay. We do this every morning and afternoon. Just to give us an idea of like what kind of species are in the area and their abundance, they say ecology is the study of counting, which I have definitely noticed that here. Like basically all we do is, is collect a bunch of organisms or find a bunch of organisms in our scopes and we just count and identify species. It sounds easy enough, but when you start counting in like the hundreds uh, and then you see multiple species at once and you have to remember how many of each species you already saw it can get really confusing so I mean not the worst problem to have there are harder things to do but yeah it is not as easy as it may first seem birds every day two times a day well this information is actually pretty useful to ecologists so basically if you don't know ecology is the study of how organisms interact uh, with other organisms and the environment so how do they influence other living species and how they are they influenced by the abiotic environment as a whole so it's really useful to have data on uh, population numbers because that can 
give us a lot of information about the species in this area. These birds are mostly seabirds, so we can look at um, their abundance and composition. So abundance just means how many of each species there are in the area, and composition is how many of each species relative to others there are. Like. So basically what percent of each species makes up the whole community, that's what composition is. Um, and then we can also look at other things because like I said, the environment can influence these species so we can look at um, how certain weather patterns for example for example um, influences the presence of species at a certain time of day uh, we can also look at how these shorebirds influence the populations of the intertidal organisms because obviously they're here to forage on like worms and mussels and clams and stuff like that so this data can assist us a lot in like researching a lot of different questions and that's why it's really important what we're doing like of course we're doing this here to you know um, for grades and it's just like an exercise so we understand how to identify species and do uh, bird counts and stuff like that but like this data is not just like for shits and giggles like we can actually use it and that's what's so fantastic like the little bit that we have done in these last two weeks can uh, help scientists for years to come and we're not going to be the only ones studying these shorebirds and doing these counts once we leave there's going to be other people from other universities maybe even other glendon uh york university students from next year are here and continue to do the counts and again that data is really important as well and we can compare it to ours so it is really important what we're doing here and that's what's so fantastic i feel like you know I, what i'm doing actually has a purpose and that's what i really like about ecology Thank you.